Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Thank you, Karina. Um, so, you know, recorded in 2020 and her message is still so important today. We're thrilled tonight to be able to um, get together and talk about um, the uh, effect that humans are having on our planet and how um, this affects the entire community of, of people um, and the, um, we need to consider the history and the culture and all of these dimensions of the problem that we all face. And I think um, no one can be aware today and not be aware, not think about the many climate related um, disasters, conflicts and so forth that we are seeing today. Um, we are going to um, hear a whole lot of wonderful detailed information. Um, so I won't, um, so I'll, um, Get, I'll let um, Phoenix tell you about that shortly. Um, I wanted to make a special shout out today um, because um, we have um, we have Phoenix Armenta who has been um, in the Bay Area working on environmental justice and building the awareness of the community of the uh, impacts of our lives on um, the people and the planet around us. And has um, uh, I was very privileged to talk with her and a group of young students last week about her journey. And I was just so impressed by the many accomplishments and her willingness and her ability to um, undertake different, um, different projects and, and to take a look at um, a problem from all angles. I want to give a special welcome tonight to Phoenix's parents who are here, um, Kathleen Fernandez and Jerome Lambert, um, and want to welcome um, you to our, our program and say how proud we are to be able to offer uh, Phoenix as a guest speaker tonight. So the month of June was um, very rich in terms of um, activities at Lake Merritt, and um, there were, uh, we had, had an opportunity to interact with some students in our sister city of Japan through the GLOBE program. And on um, yesterday, um, our Oakland youth did some uh, water testing measurements um, at Lake Merritt, and on the same day, though actually it was uh, a bit earlier because they're Times uh, is different, but they also went out to the shores of um, um, Fukuoka, the bay there, um, to do similar observations. And our students were happy to report that at that particular time and day, the water in Lake Merritt was healthy in terms of dissolved oxygen um, and salinity and other parameters that indicate its, um, its health. But this is an ongoing monitoring program and it requires um, testing more than once, keeping up a, 
a view of what's going on in uh, the waters of the bay, <coughs> excuse me, and Lake Merritt. The other thing that happened this month was truly weird. We had the appearance in Lake Merritt, in the lower left corner here, of a clinging jellyfish, <coughs> which is not native to the California coast, has not been seen in the bay or in Lake Merritt, um, according to the records that we could find, um, mm -hmm. including um, asking people at the California Academy of Sciences. So how it got here, and the tide gates were closed during this recent period, and um, in what form of its life cycle? This is fascinating. There's so many interesting observations and questions to pursue um, at Lake Merritt. Uh, we <coughs> also um, participated in um, the uh, California Academy of Sciences Snapshot Cal Coast. Um, and we um, posted a table right by um, the boathouse and uh, people dropped by and uh, took a look at um, the uh, organisms in vertebrate and vertebrate and planktonic and loaded their observations up to iNaturalist. Um, and then uh, we used a very unique technique, probably not used anywhere else. Um, we were able to go through the algae that was pulled up from the bottom of Lake Merritt um, by the algae harvester and um, our interns helped us to do that. We found many fish that had not been reported yet as returned to Lake Merritt. So that was a pretty interesting finding. And in the middle, um, one of our um, um, supporters and wonderful friends, Adrian Cotter um, from the um, Lake Merritt Underwater Observatory um, showed the um, students what the lake looks like underwater. Um, and it was uh, quite different from what it had looked at, at like before the um, algae bloom. So um, it was uh, just a wonderful um, month of doing biology, water testing, um, and sharing this with the community. Hi, we're so thrilled to, to be able to um, uh, talk briefly with uh, Dan Kalb the uh, California State Senate um, candidate and a longtime advocate of environmental justice and water quality in the city of Oakland. And Dan, thank you so much for dropping by. Uh, my pleasure, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, great to be here. Uh, always, uh, I, I always, always love what, what you all do uh, with uh, Lake Merritt. Uh, the, 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 all the nature center, all the activities that you all do to protect Lake Merritt, to inform people about the history and realities and ecology of the lake. Um, I, it's, it's always, you always have, a, as you know, I think you know this already, you always have a, a warm place in, in my heart. So um, thank you for, uh, uh, for everything you're doing and continuing to do. Uh, I know you have these, uh, these Zoom gatherings, is it like once a month or so or twice a month? How often do you have these? Uh, we have them once a month. Yeah, yeah, I've been, on, I've been on a number of them. And so I really enjoy being on them. Uh, I, I, don't wanna, I don't have a lot to say. I'm actually recovering from a little uh, bicycle accident a few days ago. Um, so, um, but I just wanna say thank you to all, all, I see David over there. Hi, David, how you doing? Hello, Dan. And uh, if you don't mind me interrupting, I just wanna say that uh, you're being, quite humble and I so I, I'll uh, let you rest and perhaps uh, heal and speak on your behalf in terms of uh, your years on the Oakland City Council as I've known you and how you've shown up in the forefront of the organizing and helping our communities and society move towards uh, greater environmental awareness and activation and uh, efforts to addressing uh, climate change and sea level rise, and and that's greatly appreciated. We've uh, known you for several years and uh, appreciated that work. Well, thank you, David. Appreciate that very much. I try to make sure that with all the many things we have, all the many challenges we have in Oakland, that um, the various environmental challenges uh, should not be on, put on the back burner. We have to keep those up front and center, 
uh, much of the time. And, and that's what I try to do and have been doing uh, for many, many years, both during my time on the council and before as well. So um, I, I see Phoenix here. Uh, great to see you, Phoenix. As uh, for those of you who don't know, Phoenix was one of my staff people my first year in office doing some great work in the city. So um, great to see her again. So I'll, I'm just going to listen for, for about um, 20 minutes or so, and then I have to go off. But um, uh, thank you again for all you do and, and looking forward to hearing part of the presentation. Thanks so much, Dan. Sorry about, I have a dog in the back. <laughs> but, yes. Yeah, well, okay. and, and Katie, as we go forward, I want to acknowledge, I think we have a, a former city council member with us this evening, Wilson Riles, Jr. And perhaps after uh, we hear a bit uh, from Phoenix, we, uh, he can have an opportunity to say hello as well. Oh, I'm so excited. Uh, is it okay to start talking now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just I just want to say like it's it's really exciting to have you here today Dan. Um I I didn't put this in my PowerPoint presentation but I'm glad that you're here because Dan Kalb has been so instrumental in my journey in my career. Like he was the first person to give me an insider's view of what government was like and ever since then I have been like determined to get people to have that that insider's view as well. And you know I I think a lot of people when you work with like a politician, you think, oh, you know, you're going to work with someone who's kind of dirty, whatever. And I was just so lucky to work with someone who had so much integrity and who was so smart and so capable. And in the year that I spent with him, I spent, I learned so much. So, uh, you know, thank you for being here tonight. Um, and also Wilson Riles has also been a really important part of my journey, a great friend. And it's great to see you all here. Uh, I guess I will share screen. Yes, thank you so much, um, everybody. Thank you, Dan, and get better. And we totally, we appreciate you so much uh, for supporting the lake and every, and us, and Lake Night Institute. Yeah, thank you again. Okay, so um, without further ado, um, we will introduce our guest speaker, um, Phoenix Armenta. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank the Rotary Nature Center for having me here tonight. Uh, as you said, my name is Phoenix Armenta. I'm the Senior Manager for Climate Equity and Community Engagement at the SF Bay Conservation and Development Commission. I've been working in the field of environmental justice for over 20 years and have traveled the world working with communities on issues of contamination and environmental pollution. Tonight, I wanna to talk about my journey that took me across the globe and back here to Oakland, as well as look at some of the ways that we are addressing the issues of sea level rise here in the Bay Area. Particularly, I wanna talk about how sea level rise is going to impact what we call vulnerable communities, communities that are at the front lines of facing down the issues of sea level rise and contamination. So I think this, Rather dark picture is a picture of me, a young me with my family on vacation in California. Uh, I had no idea at the time that I would one day be, live here, but I did know that on that vacation, I fell in love with the Bay Area. Uh, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington, surrounded by trees, but a little bored of my environment, wanting to see the world. We were what you would consider a low-income family living early on in the more industrial side of town. However, when I went to junior high school, my mom moved us to a wealthier school district surrounded by trees. The contrast of the two environments made a great impression on me, and I was painfully aware of the economic differences between my family and the wealthier families that I went to school with. At that time, I didn't have language for it, but I felt the disparity between me and my classrooms, and my classmates. So uh, college would give me the language to talk about those feelings. I was lucky enough to receive a full scholarship to go to Howard University, a historically black university. It was at Howard that I began to be politicized, learning about social and racial justice and finally gaining the, lack, the language to discuss the disparities I'd felt previously. At Howard, I learned about common issues felt across the black diaspora and it was there that I was first introduced to the concepts of environmental racism and environmental justice. So environmental racism, racism refers to the disproportionate siting of hazardous projects, including industries among Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color. 
59% of people living within a mile of a hazardous site in the US are people of color. If you're an African American, you are more likely to live near a hazardous site regardless of income. And 90% of all uranium mines are worldwide are on indigenous land. It was facts like these that enraged me and sent me on a path to per pursue environmental justice. Environmental justice is defined as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies, according to the EPA. So pursuing a career in environmental justice means trying to right the wrongs that have been made against communities of color and empowering those communities to be the ones who help to solve the pollution issues that they're facing. So after graduating from Howard University, I took a job teaching English in Hiroshima, Japan. In Hiroshima, my desire to pursue environmental justice commingled with my involvement with the anti-nuclear community in Hiroshima. I joined a group called the Global Peacemakers Association. It was a small grassroots group made up of hibakusha, or what we call the victims of the atomic bomb, and some English speakers. Our goal was to teach the Hibakusha how to speak about the horrors of nuclear weapons so that they could travel around to countries that had nuclear weapons and try to give, convince them to give them up. Through my participation with the Global Peacemakers Association, I began to learn about the pains that the nuclear industry was wreaking around the world. We met with Iraqi doctors who were talking about the effects of depleted uranium, which the U.S. was dropping on the country in, form, in the form of missiles. We spoke with members of the Dine tribe who told us about living near a uranium mine. We hosted participants from India and Pakistan to talk about the nuclear arms race between the two countries. It was through working with the Global Peacemakers Association that I learned about the residents of Jadugoda, India. Um, at that time, so Jadugoda, India is a, a small village in Jharkhand, India, which used to be a part of Bihar. Uh, and at that time I was there, Jadagoda, India was the site of India's only uranium mine. Uh, it's where they got all the uranium for their nuclear power and for their nuclear weapons. Uh, as part of the Global Peacemakers Association, we watched a documentary called The Buddha Weeps in Jadagoda, which talked about how uh, the, the folks who own the uranium mine would um, carry the uranium through their community uncovered. They would go through the community and uncovered trucks and the uranium would fall out onto the road uh, where they were drying their rice and how uh, the people who worked in the mines would go in with the same clothes that they would take back to their homes and their, their wives would actually wash the clothes in the same water that they would bathe in. And um, through all of this, we also learned that many of the children of Jadagoda were suffering from birth defects and that cancers had become numerous in the community. Uh, I decided I wanted to work with the people of Jadagoda to see if I could help their fight against the mine. I connected with and did research with the Jharkhand Organization Against Radiation, also known as jo JOR, whose members are pictured here. I was so inspired by their organizing that I, I started to want to be an organizer too. I mean, at that time, I was at UC Berkeley um, doing my graduate research. And after finishing my graduate degree, uh, I started community organizing in Oakland, California. Since then, I've worked on campaigns across the Bay and dug deeply into some of the environmental justice issues in this region. Okay, so jumping to Oakland, California. So this slide here tells a story about Oakland in four maps. The first map in the upper left-hand corner is a redlining map of Oakland. Redlining was the banking practice of denying home loans to members of certain communities in the 1930s. The areas in red were labeled undesirable, usually because they were communities of color. Uh, the second map in the upper right hand corner is from Cal and Virus Spring. It shows how much environmental burden a community is experiencing today. The areas in green are the least environmentally burdened and the areas in orange and red are the most environmentally burdened. You can see that the same communities that were environmentally burdened, uh, oh, sorry, 
today are the same communities that were redlined in the 1930s. If you look at the bottom left-hand map, you can see that those same communities are where most of the toxic sites are located. The bottom map is the EnviroStore map, uh, which shows an inventory of toxic sites across California. And then finally, the last map shows predictions for where sea level rise is going to affect Oakland. You can see those same polluted, overburdened communities are going to be the, some of the first people to have to deal with sea, sea level rise. Furthermore, sea level rise is going to disrupt those toxic sites, potentially sending pollution into people's homes. This is the issue that I'm now focused in, on in my work. Just to see what it looks like in reality, here are some photos of West Oakland. The first is of the port, which brings goods in and out of Oakland every day. Those containers travel through Oakland on diesel trucks that pour pollution into the air, putting West Oakland into the 98th percentile in terms of air pollution in the country. West Oakland is also home to, new, to a number of homeless encampments and the site of a lot of illegal dumping. These are just some of the issues affecting the community. In February, 2020, McClyman's High School in West Oakland was found to have trichloroethylene, a dangerous cancer-causing chemical in its soils. I was brought in to help with the community engagement on this issue, and for me, it made the issue of cleanup to toxic sites a major priority. Environmental justice will only be achieved when everyone has the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. Right now, there are so many barriers uh, that, to making that a reality. So people are living in, in environmental just people living in environmental justice communities are rarely a part of the decision-making process, and the government agencies who are responsible for this are opaque and hard to engage. In my work, I've tried to come up with ways to get people engaged in planning for their own communities in a way that empowers them to be decision makers and allows them to participate on an equal playing field with those who are in power. So this is how the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy was born. So uh, the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy was a project hosted by the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project while I was working there. And it was funded by a $180,000 grant from the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority. This is a picture of some of the participants uh, at Judge John Sutter, Sutter Park uh, over in West Oakland. So the Shoreline Leadership Academy was a six month long training and planning process that focused on the Oakland shoreline. We paid 14 participants to come out and learn all about the shoreline uh, and make their own plans for projects related to what they learned. So we paid them $25 an hour. They went out to six different places along the shoreline uh, and they were put through a planning process where they were, uh, they all came up with their own plans, uh, and also, uh, were taught communications, uh, to tell their community what it was that they were learning about. Uh, I'm sorry. so during the six months of the program, participants were expected to spend a total of 24 hours a month working on the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy. Eight hours a month were spent exploring a different part of the shoreline. Eight hours was spent learning the different topic areas on Zoom. And eight hours was spent developing their plans and communication pieces to educate the public about what they were doing. During the course of the project, participants created Instagram and TikTok posts, got interviewed by local media, and even had a short video made about their efforts. So the idea put behind this was to get people the information that they needed in order to be able to uh, work on pro projects related to sea level rise and shoreline planning. Uh, they, you know, they learned uh, the in, in, ins and outs of economic development, uh, sea level rise, uh, project planning, uh, and green infrastructure to name a few. Uh, the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy worked with a variety of stakeholders to lead trainings on different aspects of shoreline use and development. Each of the organizations brought in their unique expertise and trained 
the participants on how their institutions work and how the participants might work with them on their final projects. So we were able to partner with, as you can see, Cal APA, the Port of Oakland, East Bay Regional Park District, the City of Oakland, Save the Bay, Cal Academy of Science, NOAA, BCDC, and SFEI. Uh, you know, this the trainings were, you know, tours of the park. Um, we, we actually brought a naturalist in, in with East Bay Regional Parks. They learned the history of the parks. Uh, with Save the Bay, they did a restoration project. Uh, so they uh, cleaned up the sh shoreline at MLK Regional Park, and then they did some weed pulling uh, and learned about the native plant species there. Uh, Noah came in and taught them about gr uh, green infrastructure, green and gray infrastructure. SFEI came and told, taught them about operation, uh, operational landscape units. Uh, and, you know, through this, they were able to get kind of an insider's look at what it was like to do shoreline planning. So here's what one of our participants had to say about the experience. Being an Oslo participant allows me to learn and see the various ways in which our built in shoreline environment can be enhanced to invigorate natural habitats for wildlife and promote eco-connected healing for people. Since starting the program, my perspective has changed drastically. I'm able to reimagine how humans and wildlife can intersect productively based on consideration and compassion for the well-beings of both. So that was Shai Walker, who, who is, uh, was one of our resident planners. She's a West Oakland resident, and she's actually been one of our most successful uh, graduates from the program. So since she left the program, she got a uh, grant, a $5,000 grant, to figure out how to start her own nonprofit. Uh, and she's got her nonprofit fiscally sponsored. Uh, in the course of that nonprofit, she's already gotten a contract where she's gonna be working with uh, the Oakland Alameda County uh, OLU, uh, Oakland San Leandro OL, OLU group uh, to do a project at MLK Regional Shoreline. And her project, which was called Sacred Spaces, uh, which was looking at how to create uh, like what she called sacred spaces, which would be like meditative spaces along the shoreline, uh, is you know on its way to being uh, developed. Um, she she's also serving on a couple of different boards, uh, and that was actually one of the most successful things that we saw out of the Oslo participants. Uh, at this point, like fully seven of our graduates uh, are serving on various boards, uh, including SFBRA, oh, sorry, the San Francisco Bay Restoration Authority Board, uh, the Wetlands Regional Monitoring Project Boards, uh, and a Middle Harbor Shoreline uh, Enhancement Board. Um, we also have like some of our youth who are going off to college and are going to be studying to become environmentalists. Uh, and so, you know, we we're able to see a lot of success come out of this program. So I want to jump a little bit to talking about my work with youth, uh, with the Mycelium Youth Network. So uh, this is a couple of years ago, I met a woman named Lil Milagro Enriquez, uh, who had this idea that she wanted to help youth to start preparing for climate change. So she was aware that, you know, young people were feeling scared and hearing about climate change, and they didn't have the tools to really address uh, how they were going to prepare for it. So she started the Mycelium Youth Network. Um, I was actually one of the first teachers at the Mycelium Youth Network. Uh, and yeah, uh, that was six years ago. And now it's gone from being like a, a small startup to like a, a vibrant organization that has about 10 employees and has uh, trained hundreds of youth on how to prepare for climate change. Uh, this. Uh, here represents the what they call the strands, uh, sort of the foundations of what the mycelium youth is created on, which is climate and community resilience, applied science, technology, engineering, and math, and indigenous ancestral traditions and wisdom. 
When you're a student working with uh, Mycelium Youth Network, you start out first with what we call climate resilient programming. So this is a year long teaching program that where we go into schools and we kind of take over the science classes for the year. And we have six different modules that we treat, we teach throughout the year. Uh, the first one is water is life. So understanding water, the youth will learn about the water cycle. They learn about how to purify water. Uh, they learn how to do, um, what is Evap I forget what it's called, the water evaporation tool. Um, Sorry, they, they learned a couple of things related to that. Then we go into our Clean, as, clean Air as a Right program where they uh, learn about air quality, um, particularly around wildfires. In that program, the youth learn how to create their own um, air purifiers from uh, filters and uh, box fans. Uh, they also learn about indoor air quality and they create their own uh, homemade vin vinegar cleaners. Uh, to help com combat poor indoor air quality. Uh, and they get um, connected to the, you know resources like Purple Air and get to know about organizations like the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project that have been working on air quality issues. Uh, the next one is eco mapping our hoods. And this is where we take the students through a series of maps like the ones that I showed you before and help them to kind of contextualize their communities within uh, within these these different maps and understand what are the the harms that they can they can expect to come to their communities and ways in which they can you know measure what is happening to them. Uh, science for sur survival uh, just looks at ways in which they can prepare and become more resilient for through using scientific ways. Regenerative economies looks at how our economic system is tied to the climate crisis and ways in which we can go to more towards a circular economy. And then growing our health is really about uh, how, how can we grow food uh, to sustain us in, in this uh, arena. Um, so that's sort of like the first year of folks going through uh, mycelium and then in the second year, the youth have the opportunity to join onto a youth leadership council. So this is not a part of their regular classroom. This is actually a paid internship that young people will get paid to, um, in the first year of their youth leadership, they'll do participatory action research. So they actually do a survey of their community, asking their community, what are the most pressing climate issues addressing their community? Um, they also get go on field trips and get to see different parts of Oakland, um, and they meet with um, climate professionals and do um, informational interviews with them to learn about the work that they're doing. And then they're able to pick two climate professionals that they want to work with in the future. And based on all of that, they create a, a climate action plan for an issue that they want to work on in their community. So when I did this, I did this at Met West High School, which is very near to Lake Merritt. Uh, the students in the course of the year identified the fact that their school was a, a, a toxic site uh, and that they wanted to learn about how to remediate that toxic site. Um, I kind of wanted to, that's, this is kind of tricky because I'm changing things, but I kind of wanted to show you um, let me see if I can do this. Uh, where is it? So this is an Instagram post that I wanted to share with you about the second year. So this is uh, the second year of their program. They actually did a biochar a uh, project where they they had bi biochar and sheep and mulch put down as a means to addressing like the toxicity of the soil in their campus. So Okay. 
let's see what else do I want to say about the Youth Leadership Council. So that that project is started out um, in two schools, but it's we're it's been spreading to schools across the Bay Area. There's also a group in um, Mission High School, and they chose a bioremediation project as well, but they chose to go with mushrooms. So they've been doing a mushroom project at their school. And then I know it's also, um, they're also doing it at Aspire High School. And I'm not sure which, I think that those might be the three main ones at this point. Um, but, you know, that's just one of the ways in which we're empowering youth to get involved in dealing with issues of sea level rise and contamination and pollution in their communities. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing now with BCDC, the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. So I actually started working on this when I was with the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. Uh, and we got introduced to the uh, Bay ADAPT, which is a regional consensus driven strategy that lays out the actions necessary to adapt the Bay Area to rising sea level to protect people and the natural and built environment. So really this is a region wide effort to start planning for what we're going to be doing for sea, to address sea level rise in the Bay Area. Um, so I started working on this when I was at the um, West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project and I worked on the joint platform. So this is kind of the initial plan that we have. Uh, it is a plan that has nine actions and 21 tasks. Uh, engaged over 360 participants in two public workshops, had a 30-person diverse leadership advisory group, of which I was one, uh, 81 working group members, 10 focus groups, over 50 presentations across the region, and 55 endorsements from cities, counties, and states. So this actually lays out sort of the first aspects of what we plan to do in terms of implementing a sea level rise plan. So it has in it a sort of ideas of like doing a, communi a, a region-wide communications plan, uh, connecting with schools, uh, bringing together and aligning agencies uh, for sea level rise planning and helping local jurisdictions with their sea level rise plans. And that is where we get into the regional shoreline adaptation plan. So this is the second stage after the joint platform, where we're actually gonna be creating a series of guidelines for local jurisdictions so that they can plan for sea level rise in a way that's equitable and in a, in a way that, you know, make sure that we're all coordinating together so that one area isn't making a plan that's gonna help hurt another area. You know, we won't have San Leandro making a plan that's gonna harm Oakland or, you know, we're in city making a plan that's going to harm San Rafael. We want to make sure that we have coordinated effort and that it's done in the most equitable way possible. So in this effort, we're creating those guidelines, and then that's going to lead to local jurisdictions to creating their own plans for sea level rise. And let's see, I think I'm ending early, but I want to say the next step for us uh, is to actually create a region-wide Bay Area Shoreline Leadership Academy. So we plan on taking the what we did in the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy as a pilot program and making it a Bay Area-wide program. Uh, we are looking to launch that in January of 2024, and we're in the plans of, for making it happen soon. So we're hoping to, we're right now looking for funding we're hoping that we can pay, pay residents to be a part of this and that it can be a way to get people funneled into uh, helping those lo local jurisdictions to create their plans for sea level rise. <laughs> me. Phoenix, as, as we go forward, I wonder if you could clarify your, uh, your role in your work, uh, the distinction between your, your work with the uh, Bay Area Shoreline project versus the uh, Bay Adapt project. 
So Be Adept is the planning process and the the Bay Area Shoreline Leadership Academy is going to be sort of the educational wing of Be Adept. So you can imagine Be Adept is like the umbrella that all everything exists under. And the, and the Bay Area Shoreline Leadership Academy is going to be like the educational portion of Bay Adept. Thank you. Thank you for asking. And that, that's actually my last slide. Um, this is my contact information. And I wonder if we can maybe open it up to questions. Well, before we get started with the questions, I want to let you know that your mother made it on to the- Oh, uh, excellent. Uh, Hi, mom. <laughs> okay. So she's muted, so I don't okay. know. Yeah, welcome. Um, and such a rich presentation. Um, so everybody, um, uh, I want to thank you, Phoenix, and um, let's um, get some questions um, for Phoenix, who's gone done so many, so many accomplishments, so much uh, insight in different ways. I have, I have a question. Yes. This is Danette's mother. Don't you think she's amazing? <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm, so she's <laughs> I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of her. Thanks, um, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is she's truly amazing. I mean, you know, just um, you know, I didn't know you that much, Phoenix, but talking to you, um, I was just um, telling the students that I have. You have so much courage and so much willingness to um, see opportunity and to take on um, projects, and um, I think that's something. I hope that they um, that resonated with them is something that would be helpful going forward for them. Um, so uh, we're going to put Phoenix's contact into the um, into the chat. Also, um, we've accumulated some background resources, which we'll send to everybody in a post chat um, uh, email to everyone. Um, so uh, let's see, we have, let's see, we have some, anybody put in some questions? Oh, very good, somebody added that, awesome. Well, as, as we uh, get started with the questions, Katie, I want to share that I was thinking over the years as I've done this work of uh, really trying to bring people of color, black and brown people and low income communities into the experience of uh, understanding our world through the lens of science and nature and being able to engage in it from that perspective and take it on and become stewards and a part of that stewardship process, I've often thought to myself as I work with the stewards and as I consider myself a bit of a teacher, what are the ingredients I need to create what it is that I'm trying to create? And now I heard the ingredients tonight and uh, it's going to Howard and it's uh, <laughs> you know, going traveling the path that Phoenix has traveled. And so um, thank you so much for that. And thank you, Mrs. Uh, Phoenix's mother. Uh, <laughs> and and this, and yeah. Um, so, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm really interested in finding out more. I'm, and yeah, I'm really interested in how um, the ideas of how how society as a whole can embrace some of the insights that you've had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, you know, you've done wonderful projects with youth and I, I think that that's, has to be a, a starting point, um, a very important um, starting point. And I'm wondering um, how, 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 how helpful or how, how have you found the scientific community, um, which has accumulated a lot of knowledge on some of these things. Um, what what message would you have for them or what what would you like from them um, in terms of helping move ahead environmental justice? Yeah, I, I think one of the things I, I kind of mentioned, but I wanted to highlight is the idea of like paying people from these communities to be a part of the process. Um, you know, we see a lot in government and like academia folks will come into a community and talk to people and kind of mine them for their information and not see that as like a valuable thing that should be paid for. And so that's that's really why with the like the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy, we wanted to make sure we actually paid people to be a part of the process 
and recognize that they're, you know, that they're valuable contributors. Also, also with the Mycelium Youth Network, where we've paid the youth when to be a part of this. So we, we wanted to recognize that what they're doing has value, that they're valuable, and and that they should be paid to be part of the process the same way any any stakeholder should be. Excellent point. Yeah. Perhaps we could check in with uh, the uh, council member Wilson Rouse Jr. if he's still with us and uh, see if he had a comment or question. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I'm honored to be here among so many heroes and sheroes around the climate crisis that we have the local heroes and sheroes and to see so many friends like Bet Betsy Schultz and uh, Dan, and particularly um, Phoenix, I, I was. Uh, my question is around McClyman's High School. Um, I don't think that the uh, toxin that's in the soil that you indicated is the only problem at McClyman's. I think they also had some lead pipes that they were trying to deal with. I was wondering whether or not they had reached out for any federal infrastructure dollars to deal with any of those uh, items? Not that I know of. So the, the, the climate issue has actually really been disappointing for me because it doesn't feel like much has been done. When, when they found that there was trichloroethylene, they did some testing and they primarily tested the air quality. And I, I didn't know about lead in the pipes, but I know in that report, they also talked about some uh, volatile organic compounds that were in the air there as well, but they didn't find trichloroethylene in the air, and so they deemed that it was safe for people to go back. Now, I don't agree with that. Um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, if, if trichloroethylene is is a problem when it gets disrupted from the dirt, I'm just like, well, have you met kids? Like, they're in the dirt. Like, they, you know. Uh, so I, 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 I still feel like there's a lot to be done with, with that, but with like working with the Department of Toxic Substance Control, as you can see, there's so many toxic sites and there's just like not a lot of money for remediation. And so I think they just, the, their prioritization for how they're dealing with sites uh, just hasn't included McClyman's as of yet. How would sea level rise, if at all, affect McClyman's High School and or that particular issue? Well, so I, I actually think that like s s groundwater rise is already kind of the reason why McClyman's is an issue. Because if you look at the McClyman's High School, uh, ar ar the, around the school is where the trichloroethylene likely came from. There was there's a, a dry cleaner about a block or two away. There's a metal working uh, a, 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 a place that's like uh, half a block away. And so those are likely the places where the trichloroethylene came from. And it's likely that through rain, through flooding, through groundwater rise, that that's how the chemicals migrated over to McClyman's. And so what we would expect with flooding happening is that that, that would just continue. And the other thing I wanted to say is that they tested the school, but they didn't test any of the houses or the communities around the school. And so it's very likely that the community members have that in their backyard, but they're just not actually doing the testing. Thank you. We have a couple of questions in the chat now. Yes, uh, we had one from, um, I'm going to say your name wrong, but it's uh, Praveen. Mm -hmm. Did you want to ask your question? Yes, did you want to? Yes, I can. Oh, yeah. I'm mute. Okay. Um, just a minute. I need to be working quicker. Uh. Hi, yeah. So my question is, you talked about at some point, uh, sort of like a Bay Regional plan where you're planning across different counties and governments. And I'm I'm kind of curious, A, like, uh, well, what are the challenges that you've seen in that, especially given some of the income disparities between like 
jurisdictions and then also i kind of wonder also like are there counties that really externalize like their environmental impact uh right now to other counties in the bay like Ooh, you're asking me to tell on people. I don't, I don't, I don't know particularly <laughs> if there's any, if there's any uh, county that's currently doing that. Um, you know, there, there are some folks who are really ad- like addressing the issue for them and not for the communities around them. I, I don't know specifically uh, I, if I can say which is. But to, to your first question about like what are the challenges we've seen working across counties is uh uh I mean I think one is just getting getting the diversity of representation for folks uh across the counties and making sure that it's not you know just mostly white men who are making the decisions has been a real challenge so we've had to work just like really hard on that and then I think just some areas just they have different ideas about how they want to deal or address this like we have uh, one area where they want to put up, you know, seawalls. And as BCDC, we don't really think that seawalls are really like the way to go. Uh, and so there's, you know, there's differences of opinion on what's going to be the uh, the way to address it. And we, we're going to have to resolve those differences of opinion because we can't have one jurisdiction just making a decision to put up a wall. And then, you know, it's basically going to affect the other one and uh, the other jurisdictions from that and then yeah one of the issues too that we came up I don't know if this is really about challenges of, across counties but you know when we did the original sea level rise projections we were looking at water that was coming from the ocean and we weren't really looking at groundwater rise and lately folks have been looking a lot more at how groundwater rise is going to affect it and it's probably going to affect much further inland uh than we are expecting uh and lead to possibly like a lot of liquefaction a lot of flooding um yeah i hope that answered your question it did thanks phoenix what sea level rises do you anticipate in the future and when might those uh occur yeah, so so I just I'm not a sea level rise like scientist, but we are projecting one foot per, by 2050 and between three to ten feet by 2100. And uh, could you say that again in English? No. <laughs> <laughs> one yeah, one foot of sea level rise by 2050 and. Uh, three to 10 feet of sea level rise by 2100. Again, we'll have to go to some graphics for that at some point so that I can understand what that may mean for Jacqueline yeah. Square or uh, downtown Oakland or Lake Merritt and uh, other uh, lower level environs. Well, the, the, the map that I showed of the sea level rise planning is from a tool that we have called the Flood Explorer. And you can actually look and, and you you can, it has a, I, I can show it to you if you want, if we have time for that, but it has a toggle on it basically where you can, um, you can um, show one foot up to nine feet, I believe it goes to. And can someone help get that link into the chat? Yeah, I'll put the link in the chat. Yeah, so you can, I've, I've um, had a chance to look but then you can take a look at um, a, a number of consequences as well on um, various activities and see how they're distributed um, based on these um, on these models, which are have a certain degree of uncertainty around them. I think they're looking at uh, some of the more um, not um, some of the more extreme predictions that might indeed happen. Um, so. Uh, we can definitely share that information in the in the chat. I'd like to um, pa- ever ask everyone to pause real briefly as we're getting uh, at the end of our hour. We'd like to um, do some thank you slides. And then if Phoenix is willing to stay a few minutes more after eight, we could um, maybe get those um, those images up and, and take a quick look and um, answer a few last questions. Would that work for you, Phoenix? Sure. As we finish, um, I thought it would be um, 
interesting to point everybody in the direction of a uh, very interesting blog by Andrew Alden called The Age of Groundwater in uh, Oakland, and talking about the mining of gold water and the various interactions between uh, different groups in Oakland, uh, rich and poor, uh, powerful and not, over um, the use of groundwater, which we know is um, being mined at a uh, unsustainable rate and affecting a lot of um, world processes. Then I wanted to mention also that um, Jerry's book um, about Lake Merritt uh, will be published any day and we released, um, and if you're interested in that, um, there's a uh, link there. Bob, uh, could you call the cat somewhere else? Ah, yes, okay. Um, then, um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today and making this such a special evening um, and hope to see you in August. I didn't change my slide, but we want to thank Phoenix and we'll change this um, later. Um, and many of our partners here at Lake Merritt um, who help with um, our programs, the Rotary Nature Center Friends. Um, the uh, upcoming chat will be on August 4th and will be um, the guest speaker will be um, Eddie Dunbar who is a professor at um, Merritt College and the founder of Insect Sciences Museum. Lots of cool insects at Lake Merritt and fun to uh, explore. Sign here. We'll be sending out the information about um, that. Um, we have our Lakeside Chats rebroadcast every month on KTOP um, Channel 10, Oak City of Oakland's um, TV station. They're on Sundays from 6 to 7 p.m. The first two Sundays uh, show archived versions, ar archived shows. The last two will show the um, current month's new show. And we'd like to uh, thank the Frederick E. Hart Foundation for Educational Opportunity for supporting our video programs. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody, our volunteers, our program participants, and partners. If you like what we do, um, please consider making a donation to Rotary Nature Center Friends. We are a all volunteer community nonprofit, uh, 501c3, and our funds go to help um, us provide programs. Yes, I, I, I hear somebody calling my name. <laughs> okay, um, so I believe we are. That was, yeah, that was just me thinking out loud, Katie. And, okay, well, uh, I got you to go, David. Okay. okay. <laughs> All, All right. right. All righty. I want to thank our producer, Rob Lamone. Um, David and uh, I are the co chairs. Uh, Kristen Furman is the art and design person. Um, she's designed a new banner um, for the entrance to Lakeside Park to uh, commemorate the um, wildlife refuge here. And then, um, as I said, we are a 501c3 nonprofit um, dedicated to um, providing interpretive education and science um, for all of the people of Oakland and um, for being stewards of the um, Lake Merritt Wildlife Refuge. Okay. Yeah, so this is our tool, Bay Area Floodish Explorer. We go into it. Hmm. You know what? I went to the learn. This is a this is a a little storyboard that they have about it. You go to explorers when you get to the map. And so this is a map of the Bay Area and you have this little toggle on the side and you can go up and see 12 inches. This is where we're gonna be affected. I'll zoom in on Oakland so we can see. Let's see. So that's 12, 24, 36. So you can see the airport is pretty heavily affected, parts of Alameda, 
48. I think this is Brooklyn Basin, isn't it? Jack London Square, not sure. Go to 66 and we get a lot of West Oakland and East Oakland is being covered. There's 84. And so you can see, then this is 108, which is covering most of the lower bottoms. So, you know, that's our, those are our scenarios. You can see a lot of Lake Merritt, is, around Lake Merritt is flooded. There's also, um, you can kind of look on the side here and it shows uh, storm, storm surges. So you can choose a scenario, say 48 inches and look at, uh, let's see. No SLR, choose a sea, so you choose a sea level rise. I'm not as familiar with this part of it. And then you choose a storm surge. So say you have a 25 year storm surge with a 66 inch uh, sea level rise. Then that, that's how it's going to affect o Oakland through that. So you can kind of play around with it. And um, yeah. When we, you use the term storm surge. Yeah. It makes me wonder whether or not the, uh, the models over the time frame may show the impact on, on city streets uh, due to uh, the increasing groundwater and sea level rise as mm -hmm. it runs through the city down towards these lower areas. Mm -hmm. With yeah, that, that, is that being calculated now or not yet? I'm so I'm not entirely sure. Like I'm not the expert in creating this map. So I, it's hard for me to answer questions like that. Thank you. No problem, sorry. But yeah. I, I do know that like this, this map, it's, we are, we're readjusting our understanding of it based on groundwater rise. So um, during the um, atmospheric rivers that we've been um, experiencing, um, I think it has have people been um, noticing or, or commenting on um, the storm surge that's experienced and which communities are being affected the most by that, I wonder. Yeah, I don't know which communities are being affected the most. I know I know a lot of the places where we were expecting flooding did see flooding during the um the 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 atmospheric rivers but oh i mean a lot of it too was to deal with like clogged drains um so that led to a lot of flooding in the communities just basically our infrastructure not being able to handle that kind of storm surge that is a problem i know um maintaining storm drains and especially if you're low down in the watershed mm -hmm. like as people as we know um around lake mara we get a lot of um the the clogging things the trash the leaves the debris mm -hmm. it all comes down from the watershed and ends up um clogging up areas that are closer to the shore which may be more areas that get less service sometimes and are occupied by um, low-income people. So um, I was um, I was in a, a classroom and I was um, it was right after the storms and I was um, struck by um, the recollections that the students had of how their streets had been affected by the atmospheric river and somebody actually had to um, wade through water to get to their front door. Yeah, well. So, um, that would be an interesting um, uh, experience to record and, and tell, yeah. Yeah. And the, I think to, to and also to your question about the shoreline, the, the toxins and the movement of toxins based on it, I know um, Dr. Christina Hill at UC Berkeley has just put out some uh, information about uh, movement of contaminants due to groundwater rise. So would be good to, if you're interested in that, check out her research. I have some references that, that you sent me, Phoenix, and, and I'll share them with everybody. If, if that's, uh, I'll, I'll share them with you first and you can see if there's 
uh, more that you'd like to add, but um, it's a it's very multidimensional uh, topic. Mm-hmm. And try, somebody interested in science of it is um, there's just a lot to to learn, a lot of modeling going on that um, can be, you know, a little, um, a little confusing. But um, as you have shown, it's something that we really need to look at. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we have a comment from uh, someone, Dick Bailey, who's somebody who's worked in this field for a long time mm-hmm. and has given a great deal of thought. And he's sharing with us that the highest sea level rise eight to 10 feet might be avoided if we eliminate the use of fossil fuels in the next seven years. And he goes on to say a reduced level of carbon dioxide in the air can slow warming and thereby sea level rise. I'm just, I don't know if Dick is with us, I'm not fully know that I get the gist of that because the elimination of the use of fossil fuels in the next seven years uh, uh, sort of uh, escapes me. Uh, unless it's just to, uh, to, to calculate the uh, amount of our impact, perhaps. Um, is that, if you're with us, Dick? Um, well, well, nevertheless. Uh, there, are, there are real goals that, um, that countries and commit to and then there are, are state there are state responses um, to that can be made like um, how the um, the mileage required from the you know government vehicles etc every little bit can affect the amount of carbon dioxide in the air but it's true like you said David that um, you know it's you know and as people point out that um, nations don't approach this on an equal footing and that some nations are stuff suffering from the amount of carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere um, since industrialization, and they need energy to get out of the um, situation that they're in. So it's a huge political problem. I, this is a well, I'd like to take actually. I made this <laughs> opportunity. Yeah. To, uh, yes, agree with that wholeheartedly and fully, and say that uh, uh, what was it the. Uh, and uh, individuals are, aren't uh, encountering this on the uh, equal footing as well. Black and brown people and people of low income. In fact, many, I, I would think not only are not fully engaged, but many may not even even connect with the idea of carbon sequestration. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, these are vague concepts that are you know talked about in the media and whatnot. But uh, you know, part of this experience is about uh, connecting more and more people with a a more deeper and fundamental uh, awareness and able to be activated no matter who they are and where they are. Yeah. We were recently considering um, plastic pollution at Lake Merritt. We did a trash audit and we noticed um, there was a great deal of plastic trash and a lot of it being related to how we, uh, how our society packages um, materials so that it's really very um, burdensome and difficult to, um, to do the right thing. And then the people who make the plastic don't really assume the responsibility for getting rid of it, such that um, each type of plastic has to be, has to find a market. You know, mm-hmm. it may have the chasing arrow on it, but that doesn't mean necessarily that it will be recycled. It means that it's theoretically recyclable, but um, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, there's, um, you have to have a, a facility that can deal with that particular type of plastic. So um, we interacted with a, a group called Ridwell, which um, has a program for collecting the types of um, trash that people have that there is no market for and trying to find a market. And that was a very interesting presentation and project that we looked at, but we also noted that um, that was placing the onus of um, cleaning up on the individual person 
who has the time and education and whatever to do that with their little tiny things that are left over, rather than putting developing a more circular economy. Yeah. Let's do a commercial break for Whit Ridwell because <laughs> you can see this. Yeah. They they found a market for these uh, for these bags. So they'll send a box to your house, and you can put all of it your bags like this these, and uh the ones that they give you at Safeway I don't oh here's one uh and then they got a company that will press these into some type of a decking mm -hmm. and so they're able to collect them but you, you you have to become a member uh of their uh operation but you know it's amazing and I guess useful because otherwise there's really nothing you can do with this uh well, there's not much that's being done uh, to reuse this type of material. Mm. So that would be Ridwell, I guess, at Ridwell.com. Mm. Check it out. Not to check it out. So, um... Gary Lips is coming in again. As yeah, I know we're getting uh, into time, but... Uh, Jerry, most of these estimates are based on the warming of seawater causing expansion of sea level rise. It does not include melting or collapsing of glaciers. In Antarctica and Greenland, these hopefully um, in the distant future might raise sea level hopefully in the distant future might raise sea level to 30 feet or so like it was 125,000 years ago. Uh, some of those glaciers are as big as Florida. That's scary. That's very scary. Yeah. It's, it's also like one of the things we don't talk about is the fact that like we might have to think about managed retreat, which mm -hmm. people don't like to talk about it because people don't want to think about moving from where they live. But it, it, you know, there may be a point where we all have to start moving more inland. Yeah, and you know, how can that be accomplished equitably given the history um, that those populations of people have um, had yeah. in those areas? It's a difficult question. Yeah. I got a plan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was waiting to hear your plan, David. You're just going to keep it to yourself. <laughs> you got a plan for you, right? <laughs> well, no. Uh, uh, it just says it's going to involve a lot of uh, relocation and uh, re, mm. re uh, a, a different idea about how we use the land between the low areas and these uh, higher areas. And so there have to be a bit of uh, adjustments made. Yeah. And then we have to uh, sort of plan for it and dedicate the resources and set them aside so that we can uh, uh, facilitate the transition. And hopefully we'll develop all of that in conjunction with our emergency pl preparedness planning processes and our climate uh, uh, preparedness uh, processes although it's a it's a slow process mm. well one, one thing i just want to say is when we do have the bay area shoreline leadership academy i'd love to send it to you all to see if you guys know folks who would like to sign up for it definitely please do um yeah i'd like to be i'd like to to be involved it sounds uh, like something I'd like to understand a lot better. But thank you so much. And definitely, um, you know, we'll, we'll share it with people who might be able to get the word out to the, in our area. So and if I thought we could raise another $180,000 for the project, I'd start it off right now. You know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of money coming down the line from the federal government for climate resilience. So I think we can. I, Vallejo just got a million dollars to do a similar project in just just in Vallejo. So there's money. Well, mm -hmm. Best wishes with that. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, um, thank you so much. Um, we have more questions. Um, and Phoenix, if people send in a question, we could forward it to you, right? If you certainly, that would be wonderful. Yeah. And really look forward to hearing the progress of your your um, leadership academy and you know, the the new the new phase. And it sounds um, just so valuable. I really appreciate you doing that work. Mm. I wish really like, thank everyone for coming uh, this Well, holiday. I think Jean wanted Wait. to ask a question because she yeah. raised her hand. Jean. Can I unmute you? Let me see how I can do that. Um, you can unmute yourself now, Jean. Thank okay, you. good. No, I was going to say is, is that the uh, estimates for sea level rise keep going up. So I was aware of the status of the modeling, including the melting of uh, Antarctica and uh, Greenland as of 15 years ago. And then three feet rise was one of the somewhat higher estimates of what it would be. And now it seems to be the low, lower estimate of how much it's going to rise. So it, things are looking worse now than they were looking 15 years ago. And um, I have another question, which <laughs> has nothing to do with tonight, but which I can't seem to get answered anywhere else, which is what happened to the birds in the uh, fenced in area uh, near the nature center? Uh, you know, the pools are all dry, the birds are all gone. What happened? Well, I think it's pretty clear um, that there was a management decision made not to um, not to fill the ponds and not to um, do whatever repair needed to be done um, to make them uh, hold water. Um, so, you know, if you're concerned about that, you know, uh, you know, talk to the um, the city and the uh, people who are in charge of um, park maintenance and particularly the maintenance of the um, the ponds. Because they're all the pictures of the birds, you know, and the big yeah. bird sanctuary, except they're gone. So. They are. Um, this is a, t a, s a slow season for birds. We've actually had a lot of um, of turns, spectacular turns out there. The number of species is held pretty good but there's been a drop in the number of individuals that's a continuing trend when you realize one of the cool things about Lake Merritt it's not just a place where a few birds live it's on the Pacific Flyway it takes birds from all over the United States and down into Central and South America come through Lake Merritt so um, you know it's a, a place to see in a sense the health of, of birds by following and studying the birds at Lake Merritt uh, we did have the fish kill, which did uh, eliminate a lot of um, fish and probably may have kept some of the birds out um, in the first part of this year. The fish are coming back and how that might restore the birds that we're looking for. Um, that would be uh, something to be followed and monitored. And I think there are people uh, who are keeping their eye on that, thankfully. So is it possible to put out anywhere you know, on the web about who to contact about the missing birds. I keep hunting around for it and uh, and I see nothing, you know, about the, the, the empty pools and the, you know, the, the missing exotic geese and such. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, I mean, so it, it's, the, the information just isn't there. And no, it isn't there. Could... It, no, it isn't there. There's been a big change. There have been a lot of changes in the departments and who's responsible for what, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is it has not been a priority. Um, so um, I can give you some, um, some, you know, numbers to, or emails to say, to express your concern. And I think that's um, where we are right now, just to expect to express your concern. Okay. Well, and and uh, Jean, you would be joining uh, mm -hmm. if we can follow up with you, uh, uh, you know, past this uh, talk. You would be joining a chorus of us who have been expressing concern about but, but, the lack as I say, of I can't find it on the web. You know, I'm searching Lake Merritt um, birds. Where did the birds go? I mean, I keep doing every kind of search I can think of, and I don't get anything. So... It would be nice if this chorus got, you know, so you can go find it I when you go Google. <laughs> I, I I hear that, and uh, we're going to take that under consideration very strongly. 
Definitely. Uh, we'll, we'll include something um, in an email to you and to other people who might be interested. If you want to send an email to me at ktnoon at AOL.com, I'll try to follow up on that note with those. Well, you know, yeah. Jean is very concerned and probably deserves yeah. a, a more proper response. Ms. Jean, we've been, uh, as a nonprofit community-based organization, we've been interacting with the city of Oakland and the public works department and the parks and recs department and over a number of issues related to per Lake Merritt and more recently lack of fresh water in the ponds has come up and uh, the uh, impact it's had on the birds the last almost six weeks now and we've been involved in communications uh, frankly to no avail and uh, but uh, given our position for us to publish it uh, in a way that uh, people could identify with it, um, it, it, it weakens our relationship with the uh, with the departments that we've been trying to work with. Okay. And it's, uh, so I wanted to just acknowledge that your uh, your sentiments are felt. Yeah. Well put, David. Well put. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that a lot of us are concerned about in trying to figure out a way forward to um, make that. You know, there's so many priorities, but to pit the welfare of birds and the beauty of the spot against some of the other very issues is, um, I think, a problem. Anyway, um, so I think we're getting to the end of our hour, and I know Phoenix has been so generous with their time. I really appreciate your sharing with us um, and... Um, the privilege of, of hearing your talk. It was wonderful. Thank yeah, you. Phoenix, you're me. great. Um, thank, thank you. you. So, oh, Phoenix, thank you so much. Give a, a round of applause for Phoenix. And thank you, everybody, for your comments. Thank you very much for being thank here you. and for all you do. Discussion. Yes. Thank you for all your wonderful accomplishments. And I don't know when I felt so inspired. <laughs> Yeah, but just great. so you guys know, she gets it from me, okay? We thank mom and dad. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a great experience, and I really appreciate all that you guys do. And I've been to a couple talks, and they're great. So thank you. Thank you so well, much. We look forward to seeing more of you and your work. Thank you very much. Thank you for what you do. All right. Oh, thanks, everybody. So we'll I'll say goodbye for now, but come back again next time. Um, we'll have another wonderful talk and continue our discussion about the lake and the refuge in the community we love. And okay. Katie, I have to say, as always, thank you so much for this beautiful work and bringing all this uh, for it for us. So thank you, Katie. Thank yeah. you, David. Thank bye you, bye. Katie. Yeah. Have a great night. Hey, David. Bye. Good night, everybody. Take Bye -bye. care until next time. Okay. <laughs>